Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. If you'd like to support the podcast, you can. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. Today, we enter the second half of the last decade of the 19th century. It was a big one, in several different ways. As usual, I will go through the important events, births, and deaths that came this year. And it's a long one, so buckle up. On February 14th, the Winnipeg Victorias would win their first Stanley Cup after defeating the Montreal Victorias 2-0 at the Victoria Skating Rink. The Winnipeg team is the first non-Montreal team to win the Stanley Cup, and the last one until 1901, when the Winnipeg Victorias once again claim the Stanley Cup. On April 27th, Sir Mackenzie Bowell resigns as Prime Minister due to cabinet infighting. He had become Prime Minister in 1894 after the sudden death of Prime Minister John Thompson, because he was the most senior cabinet member. As mentioned in a previous episode, the Manitoba schools question had spread beyond the borders of Manitoba and was now a national issue. He attempted to find a compromise in the issue, but that only caused problems within his own party. A cabinet revolt would happen in early 1896, forcing him out. He would remain as a senator until his death in 1917. By that point, he had spent 50 continuous years in the House of Commons, since the very start of Canada as a country. On May 1st, Sir Charles Tupper would become Prime Minister. Tupper had served as the Premier of Nova Scotia from 1864 to 1867, leading the province into Canadian Confederation. Upon becoming Prime Minister, he would serve until July 8th, following his loss in the June 23rd election. His time as Prime Minister, 69 days, is the shortest of any Prime Minister in Canadian history. On May 11th, Edmund Flynn became the new Premier of Quebec, replacing Sir Louis Olivier Talion. Flynn had served in the Legislative Assembly since 1878 and would take over as the leader of the party, which made him the 10th Premier of Quebec. He would serve for just one year, but during that time he focused on public works, crown land adjudication, and improving the quality of primary education within the province. He would suffer an election defeat the next year, ending the last Conservative Party leadership in Quebec history. On May 26, the Port Elise Bridge disaster would strike Victoria. A streetcar loaded with 143 people celebrating the Victoria Day long weekend crashed through the bridge in the upper harbour. Falling into the water, a total of 55 men, women and children would be killed, making it one of the worst transit disasters in British Columbia history. Due to how the streetcar fell in the water, only those on the left side of the car were able to escape. On June 12th, a coroner's jury concluded that Consolidated Electric Railway Company was responsible for the disaster because it allowed the streetcar to be loaded with more weight than the bridge could support. The city of Victoria was also found to be guilty of contributory negligence because the bridge had not been well maintained. The disaster would force the Consolidated Electric Railway Company into bankruptcy and it would reform as the British Columbia Electric Railway in 1897. On June 23rd, a monumental shift in federal politics would occur when Wilfrid Laurier and his Liberal Party swept to a majority victory in the federal election. By the time of this election, the Conservative Party was in disarray and had gone through several Prime Ministers since the death of Sir John A. Macdonald in 1891. With the Manitoba schools question, support in both English and French Canada would be eroded for the party. The Liberal Party, seen as a party that pursued free trade and radical change, instead embraced a more conservative platform, allowing them to gain former supporters of the Conservative Party. Wilfrid Laurier, the leader of the Liberals, also supported the national policy, which was important to the business interests in Montreal and Toronto. Laurier was also a big supporter of provincial rights, and several Liberal premiers supported him. On election day, the Conservatives actually took 48.2% of the votes, compared to 41.2% for the Liberals. But they suffered huge losses in Quebec due to the feeling that Tupper was an imperialist. The Liberals would take 117 seats, up from 90 in 1891, while the Conservatives took 86, down 31 from the previous election. The Conservatives also gained support in Manitoba and parts of Ontario, along with Nova Scotia, losing everywhere else. With Laurier winning the election, 
Tupper actually refused to cede power, stating that Laurier could not form a government even though the Liberals had 55% of the seats. Governor General Lord Aberdeen would not allow Tupper to make appointments as Prime Minister, forcing Tupper to resign and letting Laurier take power. As for Sir Wilfrid Laurier, he would serve as Prime Minister until 1911, and his 15 years as Prime Minister is the longest unbroken term of office for a Prime Minister, and today he is often cited as one of, if not the greatest, Prime Minister in Canadian history. On July 20th, George H. Murray would become the Premier of Nova Scotia when Premier William Stevens Fielding left provincial politics to join Laurier's cabinet in the House of Commons. That is going to be a common theme through this episode. Murray would have an immense impact on Nova Scotia, serving as the Premier of the province until 1923. His 26 years and 188 days as Premier is the longest unbroken tenure as the head of government in Canadian history. As Premier, he would push road, bridge, and railway projects, improve the post-secondary education system, and would help found the Nova Scotia Agricultural College and the Nova Scotia Technical College. He would introduce prohibition in the province in 1906, workers' compensation in 1916, and women's suffrage in 1918. Murray's government would also appoint public health officers, establish county health clinics, and fund a research hospital for tuberculosis patients. On July 17th, James Mitchell would become the 8th Premier of New Brunswick, replacing Andrew Blair, who had been Premier since 1883. As I said, like so many other politicians this year, he was enticed to join the cabinet of Wilfrid Laurier, opening the door for Mitchell. Mitchell would only serve until 1897 when he resigned due to ill health, and he would pass away less than two months after resigning. On July 25th, Arthur Sturgis Hardy would become the fourth Premier of Ontario, replacing Sir Oliver Mowat. Mowat had served as Premier of Ontario since 1872, the longest consecutive service by any Premier in Ontario history. Prime Minister Laurier would convince him to leave provincial politics to serve as the Minister of Justice in the House of Commons. As for Hardy, he would be chosen as the new Premier and would serve until 1899. In his 60s, he did not have the energy to take the government forward, but he would survive the 1898 election, the same year he passed an act that allowed all pine cut under license on Crown lands to be sawn into lumber in Canada, something that angered Michigan lumbermen. He would retire from politics in 1899, and pass away two years later. The Klondike Gold Rush Arguably the biggest event of the year was the discovery of gold in the Yukon on August 17th, which would ignite the Klondike Gold Rush. Over the next few episodes looking at the subsequent years in Canada's history, I'll likely be talking about the Gold Rush, so here I'm just focusing on the Klondike Gold Rush in 1896. Everything started when an American prospector named George Carmack and his wife, Kate Carmack, along with her brother, Skookum Jim, were traveling down the river. They began looking for gold on what would be Bonanza River, which at the time was called Rabbit Creek. While it was not known who discovered the gold, George Cormack or Skookum Jim, the group agreed that George should be the official discoverer because Skookum Jim was indigenous, and there was the worry that the authorities would not recognize his claim as a result. Carmack would measure out four claims along the river, two for himself, and one each for Jim and another man named Charlie. The claims were registered the next day at a police post on Forty Mile River, and news quickly spread in the area of the find. The area was already known for some small gold strike, including at Stewart River in 1885, Forty Mile River in 1886, Sixty Mile River in 1891, and Birch Creek in 1892. As a result, by 1896 there were already 1,600 prospectors in the Yukon River Basin. By the end of August, all of the Bonanza Creek had been claimed by miners. One prospector then set down a claim on a creek that would be called El Dorado Creek, and he discovered new sources of gold there, which was even richer than the Bonanza. Claims quickly began to sell between miners for huge sums of money. But not everyone began to make money from finding gold. Joseph Ledoux, an American who lived in the Yukon since 1882, operated a trading post on the Yukon River, 70 kilometers above the mouth of the Klondike. Instead of staking claims for gold, he chose instead to stake out 65 hectares of swamp and moose pasture at the river, calling it Dawson City, and he made a fortune selling lots and lumber to build them. Within two years, 40,000 people would be in this new community. By Christmas, Circle City, Alaska had received word about the fines, and prospectors began to set out from the city to get to the Klondike, despite the harsh winter weather. 
Among those miners, there was the real worry that all the best claims would be taken. At this time, the outside world had not heard about the gold strike, but some individuals in Ottawa had found out, but little attention was paid to it. It would not be until June 1897 when the real gold rush kicked into high gear. But that's a story for another episode. Notable Births On March 8th, Charlotte Witten would be born in Renfrew, Ontario. After attending Queen's University, where she was a star on the women's hockey team, she would become the first female editor of the Queen's Journal. She then became a civil servant, working as the private secretary for Thomas Lowe, the Minister of Trade under William Lyne Mackenzie King. In 1922, she would become the founding director of the Canadian Council on Child Welfare, serving in that position until 1941. In 1934, she was named the Commander of the Order of the British Empire and also served on the Social Questions Committee of the League of Nations. Her most notable contribution to Canadian history, though, would come at the death of Mayor Grenville Goodwin of Ottawa in August 1951. At the time, Witten was on the Ottawa Board of Control and following the death of Mayor Goodwin, she was appointed as acting mayor. She was then confirmed by City Council on September 30, 1951, to remain as the mayor until the end of the normal three-year term. While she was not the first woman to serve as mayor in Canadian history, she is the first woman to be mayor of a major Canadian city, and she would serve until 1956, two full terms, and would then serve as mayor again from 1960 to 1964. That year, she opposed the new Canadian flag, preferring the Canadian red ensign. She called Pearson's design a white badge of surrender, waving three dying maple leaves, which might as well be three white feathers on a red background, a symbol of cowardice. There are accusations that Witten was anti-Semitic, and the Canadian Jewish Congress has said that she was instrumental in keeping Jewish orphans out of Canada because she felt Jewish people did not make good immigrants. According to the co-author of her biography in 1987, Patricia Rook, she was opposed to all non-British immigration and was racist against Ukrainians. And while her racial views have discolored the view of her following her death in 1975, her contribution as the first female mayor of a major Canadian city is without question. In this interview from 1972, Whitten talks about her life. Charlotte Whitten is Canada's most famous living woman, reformer, author, TV personality. She also has had an impressive record as a social worker in the 20s and 30s. Dr. Whitten, to start off with, what has been your most satisfying achievement so far? Just keeping alive, Mr. Hamilton, and through 11 years, 16 years in the council as mayor and alderman now. And I think that's some achievement to survive that. You started off in literature and history. How on earth did you get into uh, social work and uh, that sort of thing? And... Well, I took my degree in English and history. And... Uh, at Queen's and when I took it. You see, I've been round a long time, Mr. Hamilton. I graduated in 1917. Well, that's, what, 60 years ago? Eh? Of course, I had a good university, not an instant one. Well, the Interchurch Council on Social Service was being set up in Toronto to start combining the social service departments of the Presbyterian Church, the Baptist, and the Anglicans, we always come in at the last one has been tried out on the dog. And um, <laughs> uh, they were <laughs> uh, trying a council of social service, a Baptist Latter-day Christ. They were setting up an inter-church council. Dr. Shear, the Presbyterian Social Service Department, was to be head. And they were starting this little magazine, Social Welfare. And Dr. Shear was, uh, he was looking for an assistant who could take the editing of that. What were the chief problems in social service then? Well, of course, one of the first things right off was the flu hit like that, and the men were all coming home. I was saying, uh, I was looking at that picture in the paper tonight there. I remember one of the first, this woman howling and yelling her husband hadn't been faithful to her. He'd come home with the veterans. And Miss McFedron of the family services, or the neighborhood workers they were called in Toronto, then, show that this man hasn't been faithful to you. He said he's working hard, he's home, and he said, oh, she says the baby doesn't look in the least like him. <laughs> this was the sort of problem you had in a heaving society. On March 21st, Eric Willis would be born in Manitoba. 
After attending the University of Toronto and the University of Manitoba, he would be elected to the House of Commons in 1930, serving until 1935. In 1936, he was elected to the Manitoba Legislature, serving until 1960. On January 15, 1960, he would become the 15th Lieutenant Governor of Manitoba, serving until 1965, and he would pass away in 1967 at the age of 70. On March 20th, the legendary Wap May would be born in Carberry, Manitoba. Now, Wap May deserves his own episode, and he got one earlier this year, so I encourage you to check that one out on my website or on your podcast feed. As a result of this, I'll be glossing over his life here rather than going in-depth. May would join the Canadian Army in 1916 and eventually apply to the Royal Flying Corps, fighting his first aerial combat on April 20th, 1918. On April 21st, he would be the last pilot pursued and attacked by the Red Baron before Roy Brown, another Canadian, would shoot down the legendary German pilot. By the end of the war, May had shot down 13 enemy aircraft and earned the Distinguished Flying Cross. Following the war, he would set up the first airport in Canadian history in Edmonton, where the Mayfield neighborhood is located now. In September 1919, he would take part in the first use of an aircraft in a manhunt as Edmonton police pursued a man convicted of murder. In December 1928, he would take part in the race against death when he and his co-pilot flew vital medicine to fight diphtheria to Little Red River, Alberta in the freezing cold with an open cockpit plane. His actions saved hundreds of lives. And I also covered this exploit in an episode of the podcast last year, and you can find it on my website or in your podcast feed but you might have to go back a bit. In 1932, he would take part in the hunt for the Mad Trapper, helping to find Albert Johnson, who was wanted for shooting an RCMP officer. During the Second World War, he would help set up the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan and also train pilots in search and rescue in Montana during the war, which earned him the Medal of Freedom from the United States Army Air Forces. On June 21, 1952, he would pass away from a stroke while hiking with his son. Today, May is widely honored, including through songs, the Wap May Fault Zone, the Mayfield Neighborhood, and even a rock on Mars called Wap May. On May 18th, Brock Chisholm was born in Oakville, Ontario. Named after Sir Isaac Brock, his great-great-grandfather was the founder of Oakville. Brock would enlist in the Canadian Expeditionary Force in 1915 and was twice wounded while also earning the Military Cross with Barr. After the war, he would become a doctor and would earn a degree from Yale University specializing in the mental health of children. He believed that children should not be encouraged to believe in Santa Claus, the Bible, or anything supernatural. At the outbreak of the Second World War, he would join the war effort as a psychiatrist, dealing with the psychological aspects of soldier training, eventually becoming the Director General of Medical Services. As a result, he was the first psychiatrist to become the head of a medical ranks of an army in the world. In 1946, he helped draft the constitution of the World Health Organization and also helped choose its name. In 1948, with the establishment of the World Health Organization, he became the first Director General, serving until 1953. He would pass away on February 4, 1971 at the age of 74 after a series of strokes. On June 22, Leonard Murray would be born in Granton, Nova Scotia. Now, if that name sounds familiar, it's because I talked about him briefly a few weeks ago as the man in charge when sailors went crazy in Halifax in 1945, causing $5 million in damages and drunken antics. Murray was one of the first 21 recruits into the Royal Naval College of Canada, and after graduating in 1913, served in the First World War and would reach the rank of lieutenant. He would help to set up troop convoys across the Atlantic using techniques that would be used again during the Second World War. He would continue to serve in the Navy throughout the interwar years, eventually becoming a captain in 1938. When the Second World War erupted, he was appointed as Deputy Chief of the Naval Staff, and would play a key role in the build-up of the Navy to 332 vessels. He would also be promoted to Commodore and then Rear Admiral in 1941. In 1943, after giving Sir Winston Churchill a tour of Halifax, he would be appointed as a commander of the Order of the British Empire and a companion of the Order of Bath. Thanks to the work of Murray and his efforts to keep the ships going across the Atlantic, the largest convoy of the Second World War, 167 merchant ships moving 1.5 million tons of cargo, traveled from New York to the UK 
from July 17, 1944 to August 3, 1944, without losing a single ship. Following the Halifax riot, he would quickly retire from the Navy and move to the United Kingdom where he remained for the rest of his life. He passed away on November 25, 1971, at the age of 75. On July 2, Prudence Heward was born in Montreal, and she would become a leading figure in Canadian painting during her life. After spending time in England, she would have her first public showing at the Royal Canadian Academy of Arts in Toronto in 1924, but it wouldn't be until 1932 that she had her first solo exhibition held at the Scott Gallery in Montreal. After some time in Paris, where she spent time with Ernest Hemingway and F. Scott Fitzgerald, she would get a big boost in 1929 when her painting, Girl on a Hill, won the top prize at a competition held at the National Gallery of Canada. After exhibiting with the Group of Seven, she would join the Beaver Hall Group and was a co-founder of the Canadian Group of Painters and the Contemporary Art Society. She would sadly die in 1945 at the age of 50 in Los Angeles, and today her work hangs across Canada and a stamp was issued in her honour in 2010. On July 10th, Therese Cosgrain was born in Quebec. The daughter of wealthy parents and the wife of a prominent politician in the House of Commons, she would lead the women's suffrage movement in Quebec prior to the Second World War. In 1921, she founded the Provincial Franchise Committee and campaigned for the right for women to vote in elections, which would not happen until 1940. In 1942, she stood as an independent liberal in the same riding that had been held by both her father and her husband. And while she didn't win, she would become one of the federal vice presidents of the Cooperative Commonwealth Federation and would lead the Quebec wing of the party from 1952 to 1957, making her the first female leader of a political party in Canada. In the 1960s, she would campaign against nuclear weapons and founded the Quebec wing of the Voice of Women and served as the national president from 1952 to 1963. In 1970, she was named to the Canadian Senate, serving for nine months until she had to retire at 75. In the last decade of her life, she would be awarded the Order of Canada, receive the Governor General's Award in commemoration of the person's case, and receive several honorary degrees. She would pass away on November 3, 1981 at the age of 85. After her death, she received the Bar of Montreal Medal, a stamp, and was honoured on the $50 banknote in 2004, and had a statue unveiled of her in 2012. In this interview from 1972, Cosgrain talks about when Quebec women got the right to vote in 1940. Quebec women, or the women of Lower Canada, that was Quebec at the time, were the only women in the British Empire that had the right to vote. That's very interesting when you stop to think of it. And that was in the beginning of the 19th century. And uh, then in the 1840-something, they lost that right. And it took us nearly 100 years to get it back. But um, I feel that Quebec women have played a great role because they generally were more educated than the men. And I don't know if it, for what reason, but they did not take up the place they should have taken publicly. They were uh, working in a different manner, and they were stopped often by prejudice, and uh, I think to the satisfaction of men. <laughs> I wouldn't want to commit them very much. And then when we tried to get them to come out, it was more difficult because, as I tell you, they were facing a lot of obstacles. And when we fought to obtain and achieve women's suffrage, we were only about 20 to 25 in the province of Quebec. And yet we had a lot of people who were sympathizing with us, but they didn't do anything about it. I have seen women in my days uh, when I was working out in the uh, public arena. I saw some women extremely well informed. And a lot of men in Quebec, in the rural districts, for instance, wouldn't take a decision. They'd say, well, I'll talk about it to my wife and then I'll let you know. You see, this, this was a proof that the women knew and were well informed. But on account of certain attitudes and of certain prejudices, they were not coming out. On July 27th, Anne Savage was born in Montreal. From 1914 to 1918, she would study at the Art Association of Montreal, followed by time in Minnesota at the Minneapolis School of Art. In 1922, she became an art teacher at the Baron Bing High School, where she would remain until 1947. In 1921, she joined the Beaver Hall Hill Group 
and also spent time at the Ontario College of Art, working with Arthur Lismer, another of the Group of Seven. In 1933, she was one of the founding members of the Canadian Group of Painters. She served as president in 1949 and 1960, and throughout her life she spoke out against gender inequality and always pushed for the importance of the arts in our lives. She would pass away on March 25, 1971, at the age of 74. On August 12th, Mitchell Hepburn was born in St. Thomas, Ontario. After serving in the First World War and then getting hit with the Spanish flu, he would return to his family's onion farm to work. In 1926, he joined the United Farmers of Ontario and was elected to the House of Commons in 1926, serving until 1934. That year, he would be elected to the Ontario Legislature, where he would remain until 1945. During his time in the Ontario Legislature, he would serve as the 11th Premier of Ontario from 1934 to 1942. Elected at the age of 37, he is the youngest Premier in the history of the province. As a young Premier, he would appear on the cover of Time magazine in 1937 and quickly made changes in Ontario as its leader. This included laying off civil servants, closing the home with the Lieutenant Governor, auctioning off the limousines of the previous government, putting money into the mining industry, introducing compulsory milk pasteurization, and also making the Dion quintuplets wards of the provincial crown in response to their exploitation at the Chicago World's Fair earlier. After resigning as Premier in 1942, he would continue to serve as the Treasurer of Ontario until 1943. On January 5, 1953, he would pass away at the age of 56. Today, two schools are named for him. On August 18th, Jack Pickford was born in Toronto. The younger brother of Mary Pickford, America's sweetheart, who we talked about in an earlier episode, he too would find his way into Hollywood and became very popular as the all-American boy next door, performing in 95 shorts and films by 1917. That year he would star as Pip in Great Expectations and then as Tom Sawyer in the film of the same name in 1918. That same year he joined the United States Navy as a sailor to fight in the First World War. Using his Pickford name, he started a scheme that allowed rich young men to pay bribes to avoid military service while also finding women for officers. As a result of this, he was dishonorably discharged and would go back to making films. By 1923, his career was drying up and his last film would be in 1928. Despite appearing in 130 films between 1908 and 1928, he was always in the shadow of his much more famous sister. He would fall into a spiral of drugs, alcohol, depression, and womanizing that would lead to his early death at the age of 36 on January 3, 1933. On August 30th, another famous actor was born when Raymond Massey was born in Toronto. If his last name sounds familiar, it's because his brother, Vincent Massey, was already talked about on this show, and he would go on to become the Governor General of Canada. As for Raymond, he would serve with the Canadian Expeditionary Force during the First World War, and then the Canadian Siberian Expeditionary Force. I did an episode on that some time ago, so please check it out. In 1919, he returned home to Canada and began to sell farm implements, but found himself drawn into theatre. His first acting job was on the London stage in 1922 in the play In the Zone. He would appear in dozens of plays over the next decade, numbering as many as 80. In 1928, he would appear in his first film, High Treason. In 1931, he played Sherlock Holmes in the first talking movie of the famous detective, and he would appear in dozens of films over the course of his career, earning an Oscar nomination for Best Actor for his portrayal of Abraham Lincoln in Abe Lincoln in Illinois in 1940. His most famous role would come as Dr. Kildare in the show of the same name that ran from 1961 to 1966, and he would pass away on July 29, 1983 at the age of 86 in Los Angeles. Here is a clip of Raymond performing as Abraham Lincoln at an event in 1949. I don't really know what speech you're talking about. I made so many. Look at Gettysburg Address. Gettysburg? Gettysburg? Oh, now don't tell me you've never heard of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. But you had to. You made it. Well, it seems I did. Oh, after the big battle out there. Around July, wasn't it? I thought so. Oh, no, it was in November, because in our school we... Oh, November. At the dedication of the cemetery. But I never said anything that day. Mr. Everett was the speaker. Mr. Everett? That's right. Mr. Edward Everett. Say, they don't want you to memorize his speech, do they? I don't think so. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> 
I got pretty restless during his speech, though he was the finest speaker in the land. My goodness, he went on and on. I think he talked about two hours, and I've been riding horseback in a parade all morning. The president rode a horse. Well, I guess you wouldn't exactly call it riding with these long legs of mine. More like walking with a horse, walking under me. Oh, you're funny, Mr. Lincoln. On November 3rd, Madeline Fritz would be born in St. John, New Brunswick. She would go on to become a noted Canadian paleontologist and a professor at the University of Toronto, where she taught vertebrate studies at the university. Known as a pioneering researcher in the Paleozoic fossil bryozoa, she would earn the title of Great Grandmother of Paleozoic Bryozoa. From 1936 to 1955, she was an associate director of the Royal Ontario Museum and the paleontology professor at the University of Toronto from 1956 to 1967. She would pass away on August 20, 1990 at the age of 94. On November 7th, Henry Botterell was born in Ottawa. In 1916, he would join the Royal Naval Air Service and became a probationary flight officer with the service in 1917. On August 15, 1917, he received his wings and was flying with the No. 8 Naval Squadron the next month. On September 18, 1917, his plane crashed at Dunkirk after his engine failed, resulting in head injuries, broken teeth, and a fractured leg. He would spend six months in the hospital and was sent back to Canada, but before he could go to Canada, he was able to do 10 hours of refresher training and was approved to fly once more. He would then serve as a pilot in the Royal Air Force from May 11th to November 27th, 1918, flying in dozens of missions and shooting down one German observational balloon. His real mark on history, though, is the fact that he lived to the age of 106 when he passed away on January 3rd, 2003. That made him the last surviving pilot in the world to have seen action during the First World War. Notable Deaths On April 29th, Hart Massey would pass away at the age of 72. Again, if that last name sounds familiar, well, it's because he was the father of the aforementioned Raymond and Vincent Massey. He was born in Upper Canada in 1823, and he would join the family's farm implement company, Massey Manufacturing, in 1851, and became the sole owner in 1856. He would expand the company's market to Argentina, Australia, and Europe in the 1880s. Following his death, he would leave money to create the Massey Foundation, and the first project of that foundation was to create a student centre at the University of Toronto called Hart House. Massey Hall, something we talked about in a previous episode, was also his idea and financed by his holding company. On April 13th, Sir John Christian Schultz would pass away at the age of 56. Born in Upper Canada in 1840, he would save enough money to study medicine at Queen's College and then Victoria College. While he didn't graduate from either place, he did call himself a physician and moved to the Red River Settlement in 1861 and worked as a businessman and speculator. He would build a general store that was the first building at Portage in Maine and he also established a museum and a Masonic lodge in the new community that was springing up. In 1868, he was arrested for improper business practices, but his wife and supporters broke him out of prison and released him. His business practices made him unpopular among the Francophone community, and he was one of the leading opponents of Louis Riel's provisional government. He would be taken prisoner by Riel, but would escape soon after. In 1871, he would be elected to the House of Commons, where he would serve until 1882. That year, he became a member of the Senate of Canada, serving until 1888. Once his term as senator was done, he became the 5th Lieutenant Governor of Manitoba from 1888 to 1895. He would then travel to Mexico to improve his declining health where he passed away. On June 10th, Donald Alexander MacDonald passed away at the age of 79. Born in Upper Canada in 1817, he would become a railway contractor and was elected to the Legislative Assembly of the Province of Canada from 1857 to 1867. From 1867 to 1875, he was a member of Parliament, and served as the Postmaster General of Canada. In 1875, he became the 4th Lieutenant Governor of Ontario, serving until 1888. On June 19th, John Robinson would pass away at the age of 75. Born in Upper Canada in 1821 to Sir John Robinson, he would represent Canada at the inaugural International Cricket Match in 1844. In the 1850s, he would serve as an alderman in Toronto and as mayor briefly in 1856. In 1872, he was elected to the House of Commons serving until 1874 and then from 1875 to 1880. From 1880 to 1887, he served as the 5th Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. On June 25th, 
Sir Samuel Leonard Tilly passed away at the age of 78. Born in New Brunswick, he would go on to serve as the Premier of the Colony of New Brunswick from 1861 to 1865, and then entered federal politics in 1867, serving as a cabinet minister until 1873. From 1873 to 1878, and from 1885 to 1893, he would serve as Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick. And on November 24th, John James Fraser would pass away at the age of 67. Born in New Brunswick in 1829, he would serve as an MLA in the New Brunswick Legislature from 1865 to 1866, then from 1872 to 1882. During his second time in the legislature, he served as the fifth Premier of New Brunswick from 1878 to 1882. As Premier, he became the first politician to give the Acadian and Irish sections of the Roman Catholic community equal representation. From 1893 to 1896, he served as Lieutenant Governor of New Brunswick. I hope you enjoyed that look at Canada in 1896, and if you did, please leave a rating and review. You can reach me at craig at canadaehx.ca. You can visit my website where you'll find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes. Just go to canadaehx.ca. And again, you can support the podcast for as little as $3 a month. Just go to patreon.com slash canadaehx. Just like all of these wonderful patrons have. Aaron O'Hara, Robert Dunseith, Todd Casey, Catherine Roy, Luke S., Vic Hedges, J.P. Bear, Jason Hall, Phil Maynard, Spencer M., and Iris Gray. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.